they figuratively would be having a quiet, you know, friendly family service, like we are family. And so I hope that I can get away with being personal and reflective, um, given that it's been uh, two very, very busy weeks, and that doesn't mean that I haven't done any work on my sermons. What it does mean is that I started doing work on my sermons way before music camp. And it's amazing how life changes uh, your focus. Uh, there, there's there's uh, an anecdote from my life that I think I've shared with you before. I'm not 100% positive what I, whether I've done it in the sermon, uh, but uh, I think I've shared it with you before. Um, when I was in grade 10, I believe it was, uh, I was in music at West Hill High School, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's not accidental that I'm married a musician. Um, I really enjoyed music, and, and I was good. I was good. Uh, I wasn't exceptionally brilliant, but I was, I was good. Uh, I was, you know, mid eighties uh, by the scale of the grade. And one of my claims to fame, claims to fame was that I was the uh, first and, to the best of my knowledge, only uh, person in the history of Wessel High School to ever buy his own tuba. Uh, what a frightening thought that is when you consider it. Uh, I used to take my tuba to school uh, each day on a wagon uh, and bring it home at the end of the day on a wagon. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, that was one of the reasons, one of the many reasons I was made fun of in those days. But nonetheless, this particular time, uh, it was after band practice, after school, um, and everything was being shut down. The music teacher was in his office, and uh, I was packing up, ready to go home. And I went by the door, I think, the same night, or maybe the hands I don't know what I went to the office for. He had this office with the counter. He was standing behind the counter smoking a cigarette. It tells you how old I am to be standing in his office smoking a cigarette. Um, and he said, uh, Lord, I, I, I got a question for you. Does this story sound familiar to all of you? Or no, I'm, okay. He said, uh, uh, so I got a question for you. And uh, he said, uh, I said, yeah. And he says, you want to be a minister when you grow up, right? He didn't say grow up. Uh, he said, you want to be a minister. And I said, yeah. He says, and you're serious about that? Yeah, I was. I was very serious about that. As you know, from the time I was eight years old, that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I was used to people sort of, yeah, they're, they're being very patronizing or mocking, or given my personality and temperament, uh, just not taking it seriously. I've never come across as a particular, particularly holy type of person by a Hollywood understanding of holy, but nonetheless, um, but he was taking me seriously in this conversation, and he says, well, I want to say something to you. And um, I respected him. Archie A. Tim was his name, I don't know if you ever you know, heard of him, but he played with the Stantendon band, he played with band. Uh, he, he, he was in the Air Force in the war. He was, like, he was, like, he was a really good clarinet. Um, a lot of street cred and a brilliant teacher. I really respect him. He put stuff into his work. And he says, you know, when you're a minister, uh, you're going to have to deal with organists. Um, you're going to have to be able to communicate. You're going to be probably uh, dealing with choirs and choir members. Uh, you have to choose hymns that's appropriate to the setting. You'll have to sing parts of your services and stuff. He says, Lord, you need everything that I have to offer you. And I went, I won't say the word that went through my mind pre, pre the sentence, but he's right. I need to know what he has to offer me. And it completely changed my attitude towards music or music class because no longer was it a single event that I just enjoyed. But rather, he connected music with my heart and my life. Um, it will not surprise you to know, and it's not particularly a testimony to my intelligence, but uh, perhaps there's something of that in there, that my marks went from the mid-80s to the high 90s. Uh, and he wasn't, he wasn't messing around. He wasn't just sort of giving me candy. You know, uh, I, I actually did earn it. And, and in some sense, that's been the story of my life. And I think probably it's the story of many of our lives, that when a teacher or a mentor or somebody has managed to connect the subject matter with something that's at the core of our being, uh, it changes it for us. One of my regrets, and you know, I like that song by Frank Sinatra, and regrets have a few, but then again, too few to mention. Uh, it's nice for a song, and I think it's extremely arrogant for some just in any other context. Uh, I have regrets, and, and I have lots of regrets. Uh, there's a few big ones, a uh, number more of medium ones, and a lot of little ones. But one of the big ones is this. I regret 
that despite the fact that I had some wonderful mentors uh, in, in ministry, uh, I was introduced to ecclesiology and things liturgical and things Anglican, particularly by Peter Hannon. People have all sorts of uh, opinions about him. Uh, he always did me good. You know, he, he took me under his wing. He taught me a lot. Um, I worked with Bill White in Point St. Charles, and I learned about love and compassion, particularly for the poor and the dispossessed. I remember one time in Point St. Charles going down to meet Bill. Uh, he wanted to sort of show me around the area and introduce me to some people. And he taught me that you need to make connections, because that's where you have to get your resources. There was a Porsche factory, you know, Porsche the meat packers? Okay? There was a Porsche factory in Point St. Charles of Verdun, I forget exactly where. And we just walked in. And he waved to the receptionist, who was one of these sort of shoddy workstation desks, connected to everything the place smells like, which you would expect the smoked meat factory to smell like. And uh, we just walked in and then we went through these plastic curtains, you know the plastic curtains that hang? Right into the back, and uh, where, where, where all the stuff was ready to be packed and crated. And he said, Lord, put out your arms. So I put out my arms, and he just proceeded to load my arms with restaurant salamis. Now, not the ones that you get at Lava's. I'm talking about the uh, hunkers, you know. And I can tell you, after five or six salamis, that's a lot. And then we just went and distributed them to the people in the parish. Some of them were parishioners, but certainly not all. Uh, I went to work with Wally Sparling in uh, Ville Saint Laurent. And Wally Sparling uh, taught me about dedication to duty and discipline. Um, and he, he was, he was, he was a, a wonderful mentor. And then Murray Henderson, after him, Jim McClain. I've learned something from all of them. I've learned wonderful I've seen wonderful strengths, and I've also seen profound weaknesses too, uh, and I've learned from that as well. Uh, but one thing that I never learned was this. I so wish somebody like Archie Etienne had come up to me at some point in my ministry and said, Lauren, you're serious about being a minister. Uh, yeah, I'm ordained. Uh, you're serious about youth work. You're serious about social justice. You're serious about the future of the church. Um, and and, and I, I would hope that would be visible. Lord, in order to maximize the potential of your ministry, you need to learn how to play the politics of the situation. Because it's not only about hard work and dedication. It's not only about skills. There is a political reality. And I look back now a lot closer to retirement than I am to begin, though who knows the date. And I think that if somebody had had that conversation with me, in the same way that Archie H. had the conversation about music, it would have profoundly changed my ministry. To know how to deal with the political realities without compromising the principles. Because as I observe in people like Clarence Williams, uh, for whom I have tremendous respect, and I could give you a long list. A lot of what she does is successful because she's been able to say the right things in the right place at the right time. And it's not only about getting the work good done, it's about getting the message out. You can get some done by doing the work, but the big picture happens when you learn how to play the system. I contrast, for example, Linus Williams with uh, Ross McGregor, for whom I also have tremendous respect for what she's done at my own mission. <coughs> and I see another life spirit who never learned how to play the system. And the system, though it's created by humanity, can be used for the things of God. And I just sort of wonder, I just sort of wonder, when it says in the Bible, uh, be wise as serpents, but gentle as doves. I wonder if that's what it's referring to. That we really, really have to learn how to work the system to accomplish God's purposes. Without compromise, without selling out, but to be able to do the presentations, to be able to do the speeches, to be able to position ourselves such that others see know and understand. I look at some of the things that St. Mary's has accomplished in its history, and I see them as rather spectacular. Um, when Mark Dunwoody was here uh, the other week, the new youth coordinator of the diocese, 
he observed something that he had never seen in all his years uh, in Newport. He was just blown away by what he saw happening in Fuser Camp. He was blown away by the organization, he was blown away by the mood, by the cooperation, by the quality of it. And he wants to get together uh, and continue a conversation. I've been thinking a lot about that recently and wondering in the context of what that means for us as a congregation and what it means for our future as a congregation. Now I want to switch gears a bit and then bring it back. Um, this past week has been, I've got to tell you, a uh, rather uh, schizophrenic week. Um, three big things, uh, or at least big to me, uh, have developed uh, this week. One, of course, is what we call Science Camp. And a number of years ago, Marie and I had a conversation, and I'm not sure whether it was just us, maybe Bethany was there, maybe some other people were there. And one of the things we realized was that Music Camp, good as it was, was basically attracting the clientele of girls. And we really wanted to get guys in. Well, you know, at Science Camp this week, that's, that's where Science Camp came from. At Science Camp this week, there was one afternoon where I was sitting in the craft room, getting all sloppy with gloopy paper and all the rest of it. And it was a group of only boys. Now that's not saying anything against girls, but it was a group of only boys. And another one of the groups, uh, I may be mistaken to the exact number, but I looked around and I think it was something like eight boys and four girls. You know, there's a way to do it so that it works. There's a way to do it so that it works. So that was one thing that was going on. Uh, I was also looking around at just the spectacular talent pool. Uh, last week, um, I, I greeted Alex and Anu uh, from uh, New York City, friends of the Pichet family. And, and I, I look at kids wanting to come up, they live in Staten Island, come up to spend these weeks with us because not only do they get to give so much, but they get to receive so much. <coughs> Uh, I was looking at pictures because Ardith, um, not only does she put the camera on, uh, Ardith is one of these people that's it's sort of like the Holy Spirit. She appears, things change, and then she disappears and does something else, and things change there. Uh, we have a wonderful wealth of pictures, and I've been looking at the pictures over and over. I have some, and we're going to make a presentation for you. I have some of the most glorious pictures uh, on our laptop at home. Gail, there are two of you that are just absolutely just spectacular. And I think of the people who have given their vacation time, their first weeks of summer vacation with their students, uh, weeks of their life, you know, and, and, and it all comes together and it just will it. I can't communicate the glory of it and how spectacular it is. Nor will I underestimate that there are parents of those kids that are seeing what's going on and appreciating what's going on and searching for a way to respond to it. I had more than a dozen conversations this week alone with people who have said, I'd like to make a donation to your church because this must continue. Like they really want to support the, the, the youth work. They know it doesn't come out of nothing in this music now. And they want to support it. And I thank them very, very much. I uh, also thank the person who actually enclosed a $500 check with the application for her children, who she was paying $360 for to go to the camp. So nearly $1,000 for one family. Um, I, 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 they're trying to express something there. And so what I've said to these people is I really appreciate it. More and more people are saying this, so you'll be getting a letter with an invitation to, to, to contribute. So that's, that's, that's one side. But on the other hand, I've also been thinking this week, in light of the refugee thing that I've been talking about, that while we're doing this in a healthy, safe, wonderful environment, there are 85 million refugees, sometimes living in unbelievably horrendous circumstances, who need to find a place of safety and security where they can rebuild their lives because they've lost everything in, in human terms. Hence, a little bit of the feeling of schizophrenia. 
The third thing, uh, on Wednesday, um, Jane and I did our service, but you know where I'm going, Jane. Um, Jane and I did our service uh, at Vivalis. There weren't too many people, I think there were seven of us uh, in, in total. And I went dressed, this is the last Sunday I'll be dressed in camp clothes, uh, with Papi Maché on and some glitter glue and, you know, I was me. Um, and, uh, you know, did a service there. And one of the people who I think some of you will know, his name is Ray, uh, blind, he's come to our concerts, a loss of pain. Um, he calls with Dallas the, and us the, the best church he's ever attended. And um, there I was Thursday morning, and I got a call from Nicole, the program coordinator, and and knew had picked up the phone in the kitchen, and I took it in the office. So as I pick up the phone in the office, I'm hearing the voices of laughter and singing and games going on in the background. As Nicole tells me um, that in the night break he'd gotten up to go to the bathroom, said that he wasn't feeling too well. Uh, laid down and he passed away. And I'm thinking, you know, in in those three events right there, you've got St. Mary's. You really do. Um, all the infrastructure we have, all the people who do so much in this place, administratively and structurally, to make it possible to do what we do. Um, people who take care of the money situation, uh, people who set up for our worship, uh, people who come in as Walter does and Peter Charlson does every week to clean the place, and John does to clean the bathrooms, and um, danger and say things like that is that he does so much. The gardens, the cobwebs, you know. There's so much that goes on. It goes on to enable that stuff to happen. So that in two weeks, we could have over a hundred kids attend our camp. I think it's about 30 teenagers come as assistants and leaders to participate. Most of whom have little to do with church, but that sometimes changes in some of them. And then of course adult members of the congregation and the infrastructure people. I've got to also mention that one of the things that really struck me particularly this year, it might sound terribly low priority compared to some of the other stuff we've talked about, we looked at the snack list this year in particular. When we started out with 25 kids, okay, doing oranges for 25 kids in one work, okay? When you've got 100 people that you're preparing a snack for, that's a lot of snack. That's a lot of cupcakes. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of rounds. That's a lot of cookies. That's a lot of fruit. That's a lot of everything. Do you know we went through nearly a thousand freezes in the past couple of weeks? A thousand freezes. And for every freeze that was consumed, somebody here made a snack for those kids. Every single day. How spectacular is that? So I'm putting together the infrastructure and resources that we have with the feeling of schizophrenia I experienced this week, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but, and, well, anyway, thinking of the refugee situation, thinking of the glory of the camp, and then also thinking that St. Mary's is not only there, but also giving communion to a man who considers St. Mary's his church on the very day he passes away. Folks, eternity in the castle. That's that's where it is. Eternity in the castle. I'm going to put this part in, and, and I hope you understand the spirit that it's intended with. One of the things that I've said to some of my friends, some of my closer friends, is I wish just for one day, or even a part of a day, they could live inside my body. You know, as it, as it falls apart, you know, uh, just to understand what it feels like to live with MS. And uh, I've got a good friend because otherwise they'd be really hurt and insulted that I wish this on. But just, just, just for a period of time to understand. I would wish for us as a congregation that just for an instant, or just for an hour, just for 10 minutes, all of us 
would have a complete and open and overpowering experience of what the kingdom of God in all its fullness is going to be like. We get little glimpses. We get little glimpses in the smiles of kids, and some kids, and sometimes in the tears of kids. We get little glimpses when we form a relationship with someone like Ray. And after 94 years of age, I think, um, says that Vivalis is the best church he's ever attended. And a family who has lost everything and has, had, has no return and has none of the resources they need to reestablish themselves uh, through the grace and goodness of a congregation of God's people will have a brand new start. It will be up to them what they do with it, but they will be graced with a brand new start in life. These to me are just tastes of the kingdom. I wish all of us would have just a just maybe a momentary experience of the kingdom of all its fullness. Because I think it would challenge us, I think it would inspire us, and I think it would also give, it, give us hope. The call it for today says this. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ has taught us that what we do for the least of your children, we do also for him. Give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all, who gave up his life and died for us. Almighty God, your Son Jesus Christ has taught us that what we do for the least of your children, we do also for him. Give us the will to serve others as he was the servant of all. May that prayer be more and more true each day and each week for us at St. Mary's. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for the opportunities for service that you give us. Thank you for the people that you bring across our path. Sometimes for a moment, sometimes for a lifetime. Thank you for reuniting friends. Thank you for the synergy that happens when two or three are gathered in your name, and your spirit is in their midst, and miracles happen. Thank you that for at least some of those who attended our camps and parents of those who attended our camps, um, their eyes have been opened just a little bit more, maybe more than a little bit more, uh, to the possibilities that Christianity offers. Thank you for those in this place, but not exclusively in this place, but certainly in this place, who give so much of themselves for the sake of your kingdom. Whether it's uh, cleaning the toilets, or cutting the oranges, mopping the floors, setting the altar, changing the light bulbs, counting the money, reading the lessons, serving the bread and wine, building loving relationships, serving the poor, Thank you for this place. Thank you for the physical resources you give to us. Broken and battered, though they sometimes are. We pray for your world. for those who are victimized by the arrogance of others, for those who are dominated 
who are powerless. Who are the abused and neglected and the forgotten. Pray for those who work in ministries of advocacy. People like Glennis Williams and uh, Ross McGregor. Father, we pray for St. Mary's. Obviously, it's your church, not ours, and you have a will for this place. Open the eyes of our hearts to see and to understand what your will is for our church. Give us the strength that we need physical, emotional, spiritual, and in every other way, to serve as your calling is to serve. Give us the courage to stand when, it's, uh, when it would be easier just to sit. Courage to speak when it's necessary, and the discipline to stay silent when that's what's required. Pray for our communities. For those who govern. For those who serve the common good. Lord, let your light shine. Father, we offer you these prayers and all the prayers of our hearts to your glory and the building up of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.